Checkouts by Cynthia Ryland. Her parents had moved her to Cincinnati to a large house with beveled glass windows and several porches and the history her mother liked to emphasize. You'll be lonely at first, they admitted, but you're so nice, you'll make friends fast. And as an impulse tore at her to lie on the floor, to hold to their ankles and tell them she felt as she was dying, to offer anything, anything at all, so they might allow her to finish growing up in the town of her childhood. They firmed their mouths and spoke from their chest, and they said, it's decided. to Cincinnati, where for months she spent the greater part of every day in a room full of beveled glass windows, looking through the photos of the life she lived and left behind. But it was difficult work, suffering, and in its own way it was a kind of art, and she finally didn't have the energy for it anymore. So she emerged from the beautiful house and fell in love with the bag boy at the supermarket. She liked to grocery shop. She loved it in the way some people have to drive long country roads. Because doing it, she could think and relax and wander. Her parents wrote up the list and handed it to her. And off she went without complaint to perform what they regarded as such a great sacrifice of her time and a sign that she was indeed a very nice girl. She had never told them how much she had loved grocery shopping, only that she was willing to do it. She had intuition which told her that her parents were not safe for sharing such strong and important facts about herself. Let them think they knew her. Once inside the supermarket, her hands firmly around the handle of the cart, she would lapse into a kind of revere and wheel towards the produce. Like a Tibetan monk in solitary meditation, she calmed to a deep, deep point of happiness. This feeling came to her, reliably, if strangely, only in the supermarket. Then one day, the bag boy dropped her jar of mayonnaise, and that is how she fell in love. He was nervous, first day on the job. And along had come this fascinating girl, standing in the checkout line, with the unfocused stare one often sees in young children. Her face turned enough away that he might take several full looks at her as he packed sturdy bags full of food and the goods of modern life. She interested him because her hair was brown and thick, and in it she had placed a huge orange bow, nearly the size of a small hat. That was enough to distract him, and when finally it was her groceries he was packing, she looked at him and smiled, and he could only respond by busting her jar of mayonnaise on the floor. She loved him at exactly that moment, and if he'd known this, perhaps he wouldn't have fallen into the deep, brown depression he'd fallen into. This lasted the rest of his shift. He believed he must have looked a fool in her eyes, and he envied the sureness of everyone around him, the cocky cashier at the register, and the grim and haired their breaks. He wanted a second chance, another chance to be confident and say what he thinks to her as he threw tin cans into her bag, persuading her to allow him to help her to her car so that he might learn just a little about her. Check out the floor of her car for signs of hobbies and fetishes, and the bumpers for clues of beliefs and loyalties. But he busted her jar of mayonnaise, and nothing else worked for the rest of the day. Strange how attractive clumsiness can be. She left the supermarket with stars in her eyes, for she had loved the way his long, nervous fingers moved from the conveyor belt to the bags. How deftly, until the mayonnaise, he had picked up her items and placed them into her bags. She had loved the way his hair kept falling into his eyes as he leaned over to grab a box or a tin, and the tattered brown shoes he wore with no socks, and the left side of his collar turned in rather than out. The bag boy seemed a wonderful contrast to the perfectly beautiful house she had been forced to accept as her own, to the history she hated, to the loneliness she had become used to, and she couldn't wait to come back for more of his awkwardness and dishevelment. Incredibly, it was another four weeks before they saw each other again. As fate would have it, her visits to the supermarket never coincided with his schedule to bag. Each time she went to the store, her eyes scanned the checkouts at once. 
her heart in her mouth. And each hour he worked, the bag boy kept one eye on the door, watching for the brown-haired girl with the big orange bow. Yet, in my disappointment these weeks, there was a kind of ecstasy. It is a reason enough to be alive, the hope you may see again some face that has meant something to you. The anticipation of meeting the bag boy is the girl's painful transition into her new and jarring life in Cincinnati. It provided for her an anchor amid all the most impersonal and unfamiliar, and she spent less time on thoughts of what she had left behind as she concentrated on what might lie ahead. And for the boy, the often and long, tedious hours at the supermarket, which provided no challenge other than showing up the following workday, these hours became possibilities of mystery and romance for him as he watched electric doors for the girl with the orange bow. And when finally they did meet up again, neither offered a clue to the other that he or she had been the object of obsessive thoughts for weeks. She spotted him as soon as she came into the store, but she kept her eyes strictly in front of her as she pulled out a cart and wheeled it towards the produce. And he too knew for the instant she came through the door. And he never once turned his head in her direction, but watched her from the corner of his vision as he tried to swallow back the fear in his throat. It is odd how we sometimes deny ourselves the very pleasure we have longed for and which is finally within our reach. For some perverse reason she would not be able to articulate, the girl did not bring her card up to the bag boy's checkout when she was done shopping, and the bag boy let her leave the store, pretending not to notice her. This is often the way of children. When they truly want a thing, they pretend they don't, and then they grow angry when no one tries harder to give them the thing they so casually rejected. And they soon find themselves in a rage simply because they cannot say yes when they mean yes. Humans are very complicated, and perhaps cats, who have been known to react in the same way, though the resulting rage can only be guessed at. The girl hated herself for not checking out at the boy's line, and the boy hated himself for not catching her eye and saying hello. And they most sincerely hated each other, without ever having exchanged even two minutes of a conversation. Eventually, in fact, within the week, a kind and intelligent boy who lived very near her beautiful house asked the girl to a movie, and she gave up her fancy for the bag boy at the supermarket. And the bag boy himself grew so bored of his job that he made a desperate search for something better and ended up in a bookstore where scores of fascinating girls lingered like honeybees about a hive. Some months later, the bag boy and the girl with the orange bow again crossed paths at a movie theater. Glancing towards each other, each smiled slightly, then looked away, as strangers on public buses often do when one is moving off the bus and the other is moving on. I had a dream that you were mine. I've had that dream a thousand times, a thousand times, a thousand times. I've had that dream. A thousand times I left my